all right so <coughs> now what we are going to do is uh, look at what is called um, this is something called co-citation and bibliographic coupling now there is a uh, area called uh, uh, what you call the co-citation network analysis or basically citation network analysis <coughs> where uh, we look at uh, papers and the references you know when you write a paper uh, you should also write what papers you refer uh, to write the paper so each paper should have what's called a bibliography section or references and uh, we can build what is called a citation network depending on which paper referred to which paper okay so let us say this is a network of such some some set of papers uh, Typically, they are built for a typical uh, area. So, it's computer science or even like network science or uh, artificial intelligence. You uh, get gathered papers in, the, in a particular area and then um, you build a citation network. Uh, so, citation networks are directed graphs because <coughs> you see this is uh, on a, in a time scale. If paper A is citing paper B, uh, paper B should have been written earlier than paper A. So if I cite a paper, means I, if I refer to a paper that should have been already published in the literature before my paper gets published, isn't it? So it doesn't make sense the other way. So that's why citation networks are typically directed graphs in nature. So, <coughs> excuse me. so in the directed graphs, we need to clearly define the direction of the edges. So, in a citation network, there's an edge from I to J if paper I is citing paper J. Okay? And there's no edge from I to J if paper I is not citing paper J. Okay? And uh, so, this is a citation network. And uh, we can come up with an adjacency matrix for the citation network. So let us say there is an edge from 1 to 2, 1 to 4, 1 to 5. So these are outgoing edges. So that means paper 1 is citing paper 2, paper 4, paper 5. So we have an edge from 1, 2, 1, 4, 1, 5. So row 1, column 2, the entry is a 1. Row 1, column 4, the entry is a 1. Row 1, column 5, the entry is a 1. Similarly, papers 3, and 6 have cited 1. So that means row 3, column 1, the entry is a 1. Row 6, column 1, the entry is a 1. Okay. So in general, in the adjacency matrix, the entry Aij is a 1 means row i, column j is a 1 if there's an edge from i to j. And the entry is a 0 if there's no edge from i to j. Now, what these two things indicate? So, the co-citation and bibliographic coupling. <coughs> so, first let us see the co-citation. So, co-citation of two vertices i and j by definition in a directed graph is the number of vertices k that have outgoing edges pointing to both i and j. So, look at this example here. Uh, so, if you pick two vertices i and j, there are three vertices. This uh, these three vertices uh, <coughs> that have edges to both i and j. So this vertex has edge to i as well as to j. This vertex has edge to i as well as to j. This vertex has edge to i as well as to h, j. The other vertices have edge either to i, not to j, and or vice versa. So what does this indicate? So let us say there are two papers published in the literature. Okay. Now. <coughs> we want to find what other papers have cited both i and j uh, in the in the references so the more papers cite both i and j that means the more similar are the two papers i and j right so if there are a lot of papers out there and each of those papers have cited both i and j in their references that means there's probably a lot common between i and j. 
if very few papers have cited i and j together okay uh, again it's together i may have lot of its own citations j may have its own citations but which papers have cited both i and j together that's what we're looking at if very few papers are cited both i and j together then it means there is less common between them so that's what we call we cap we intend to capture by measuring what is called the co citation coupling index okay so uh, <clears throat> and what does this indicate uh so uh, we can find out the relationship or similarity between two papers not just uh, you know not for plagiarism purposes uh, but uh, but for uh, finding out how similar are two papers or if the two papers have a lot of co citations it means they talk about something common there's something common between those two papers so they are very related to each other so that's how that's one way we can uh, what do you call cluster papers that have a lot of that have similar uh, that have a large co citation coupling index okay uh, but there is a weakness uh, with this measure one weakness is uh, the in order to calculate the co citation index for two papers i and j uh both papers should have uh, like the, there should be some papers that cite them together right so that's by definition uh so both papers should have at least some few citations if one paper just got published so if i publish my paper just few days back and there was some other paper out there in the literature in the community published several years back then using this co citation coupling measure we cannot find out whether the two papers are related or not because if i come up with a co citation coupling index for a paper that was just recently published and a paper that was published long time back the index will be probably close to zero because one of the papers was just published so the there is very few chances that some new paper that gets written uh, is citing both these papers on the other hand if two papers are published long time back <clears throat> then there are very good chances that the papers that are subsequently written after them are citing both of them together okay so the strength is the co citation coupling measure uh, can give us a relationship between two papers as well as it grows with time that's a good thing uh, if the co citation coupling index of two papers was some number 10 years back then 10 years later if the co citation coupling index for the same paper has increased that means lot of papers are coming up on that area and they are citing these two papers together so it changes with time it could increase with time as new papers get published but that's also the kind of weakness in the sense that until new papers come up and cite these two papers together it may not be an appropriate index to uh, quantify this uh, relationship between two papers on the basis of the similarity of the matter they're talking about okay that's a kind of the strength and weakness of this two approach of this approach so let's do some math behind this so how to calculate this co citation coupling matrix uh, so by definition uh, so we want to capture the number of papers citing both i and j together right so we'll say an ent uh, so this is the matrix that we want to compute uh, for any two vertices i and j okay one second i'll be back one second i'll be back okay so what we want is to compute this matrix co citation coupling matrix um so an entry here in this co citation coupling matrix indicates the number of papers that have cited both i and j together so let us look at a case and then we'll go ahead uh let us pick up something like um 5 3 so the entry for 5 3 is 2 that means two papers have cited both 3 and 5 so if we go back to this graph so there are 3 and 
6 has cited both 3 and 5 as well as 4 has cited both 3 and 5. So 4 and 6 are the two papers. We cannot find out what two papers have cited both 3 and 5. What we can get is a count, the number of papers that have cited both 3 and 5. So <coughs> this entry CIJ is going to be a 1 for a particular uh, third where paper K if K has cited I as well as K has cited J. So remember the notation AIJ is going to be a 1 if and only if I is citing J. So there is a direct edge from I to J that means paper I is citing paper J. So if AKI is 1 means K has cited I there is an edge directed edge from K to I. Similarly, there is a direct edge from K to J. So, this K has to cite both I as well as J. Then only we can count that K as one of the papers that, has, that have co-cited. So, you want to, among all the Ks out there, among all the vertic K vertices, uh, the vertices indicated by K out there, we want to find the number of such vertices that have cited both I and J. Right? So, Cij is going to be 1 for a particular vertex k if aki is 1, if k is citing i as well as k is citing j. How many such vertices are out there? That is what is going to be the entry for Cij in the matrix. So, we are going to consider all the vertices k uh, out there from 1 to n, all the vertices out there and going to compute this product aki times akj. And only if both the entries are 1, the product is going to be a 1. And the sum of all that such product or all the k vertices, one running from 1 to n, will give you the value for Cij. Is that clear? Now, we want to do it as a matrix approach. Now, you know in, a, uh, uh, in, mat in matrix multiplication, so this is a small deviation from uh, what we were doing but this is related to matrix multiplication. Uh, so your graduate students should have taken some math or class before. So you can multiply two matrices say 2 by 3 is the uh, dimension for this matrix and uh, 3 by 4 is the dimension of this matrix. What's the dimension of the product matrix? Can anyone say? It's 2 by 3 in one matrix and 3 by 4 for the other matrix. So, first of all, can we multiply these two matrices? Yes, we yes. have 3 2 by 4. Results. The product is going to be 2 by 4 matrix and the rule for matrix multiplication is the number of columns in the first matrix should be equal to the number of rows in the second matrix. Then only you can multiply two matrices. So if it was something like this, uh, if this is say a 5 by 4 matrix, the, the number of columns in the first matrix is not the same as the number of rows in the second matrix. So we cannot really multiply these two matrices. Okay. So <coughs> if you go back here, The um, I and J are kind of like the uh, number of rows and columns, so the column, row, column index and row index. So we can multiply two matrices only if the column index in the first matrix matches with the row index in the second matrix. In order to do that, we have to transpose this first matrix so that it becomes AIK transpose. So, if you transpose this matrix, it becomes like this. So, the number of columns in the first matrix now matches with the number of rows in the second matrix. Okay. And you all know what transpose of a matrix means, right? So, transpose means just uh, writing the rows and columns in the uh, other order. So, if I say let us pick a 2 by 3 matrix. So it's going to be 2 rows and 3 columns. So 2 rows and 3 columns. So let us pick one more column. And uh, this is another row. So this is a matrix. Its transpose is going to have 
three rows and two columns. So the originally it had two rows and three columns. Its transpose is going to have three rows and two columns. So this row is going to become a column. So where is that? It went away. So let me type one more time. So it's going to be 45, 56, 67. So the column, uh, the row is now a column. The second row is now the second column. So this is what we mean by transpose of a matrix. Okay, And we are going to do all these things now here. So we can multiply two matrices like this because the number of columns in the first matches with the number of rows or the row in uh, index for the column index for the first matches with the row index for the second. So we can remove the index notations and we can simply say the co-citation coupling matrix is simply the product of the transpose of the adjacency matrix and the adjacency matrix. Okay, so it's very important to note that matrix multiplication, especially for directed graphs, is not going to be guaranteed to be symmetric in nature. So the other way, A times A transpose need not be the same as A transpose times A. So it's very important that we find the transpose of the adjacency matrix and use that as the first matrix of the product times the product uh, of the adjacency matrix itself. So this is the formula to compute the co-citation coupling matrix. And it comes from a very, from a very fundamental thing. An entry Cij is a 1 if there exists a vertex k that is citing both i as well as j. So aki should be 1 and akj should be 1. Only the product will be 1. How many such k's are out there from k 1 in from 1 to n, the number of vertices. And you can multiply these two entries at the matrix level only if the column index matches with the or the first matrix matches with the row index of the second matrix. In order to do that, we have to transpose the first matrix, and then only the the column index of the first matrix will match the row index of the second matrix, and uh, that's A transpose times A. Okay. So let us go through this example now. So given a directed graph, we should be able to come up with this adjacency matrix. So we'll follow the convention of the outgoing neighbors. So this is the version I updated from the previous slide. So download the slide that I uploaded yesterday from the come from Canvas. So uh, an entry say from one two one five and one four. So one from one we have an edge to two to four and five. So those entries are one. From 1, there is no outgoing edge to 3 and 6, so those should be 0. And of course, the diagonal is also 0 because there is no edge from a vertex to itself, so it's also 0. Similarly, you can come up with the entries for the other vertices. Now, transpose. Now, this is a square matrix, so the transpose is also going to have the same dimension 6 by 6. Okay. Um, so, but still, the entries are going to be different. So when you transpose what it should be, the row entries becomes a column entry. So 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 becomes a column. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 for the second row becomes the second column. 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, the third row becomes the third column. The fourth row, 4, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 becomes the fourth column and so on. So once you find the adjacency matrix from the given directed graph, you can get its transpose. And then all you are doing is multiply the transpose uh, with the adjacency matrix according to this formula. So let me put that here. So adjacency matrix, uh, the transpose times the uh, matrix itself. Okay. Uh, so now how to do matrix multiplication all right so i'll tell you an easier way in order to find the entry for to find an entry for cell i comma j in the product matrix multiply 
the uh, entries in row i in the first matrix with the entries in column j of the second matrix uh, and sum the pairwise product values. So all it means is this. If I want to get say an entry, let us pick what this 5, 3. If I want to get an ent entry corresponding to row 5, column 3 in the product matrix, I have to pick row 5 in the first matrix and column 3 in the second matrix and multiply them so, par and do the pairwise sum of the product values. So it's going to be 1 times 0 plus 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0 plus 1 times 1 plus 0 times 0 plus 1 times 1 and that's going to be 2 because uh, you have 1 times 1 and another 1 times 1 that's going to be 2. So that's the rule. In order to get an entry for cell i comma j in the uh, product matrix multiply row i in the first matrix with column j in the second matrix. Uh, let us do few more. So if I want to get this entry for cell 1 comma 2 in the product matrix multiply row 1 in the uh, first matrix with column 2 in the second matrix which is this. So again this is true for any two matrices that could be multiplied. This is not just for this case. So for any two matrices to be multiplied and that could be multiplied by satisfying what rule? The This rule should be satisfied. The number of columns in the first matrix should be equal to the number of rows in the second matrix. And you could see that when we apply this rule here. See when I multiply do the pairwise multiplication. Let us do this. Row 1, column 2, right? I want to get this cell row 1, column 2. So I multiply the entries in the first row of row 1 of the first matrix. So the entries in the first row or row 1 of the first matrix, how many entries are going to be there? That's corresponding to the number of columns out there in the first matrix. And I am doing the pairwise multiplication with what? The column 2 of the second matrix. And how many entries in the column are going to be there? The number of entries in the column are going to correspond to the number of rows in the second matrix. So in order to do the pairwise sum of the product values, the number of columns in the first matrix should be equal to the number of rows in the second matrix. Otherwise, we cannot do the pairwise sum. So that's why the rule or requirement is there. Okay. So it is 0 times 1 plus 0 times 0 plus 1 times 1 plus 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0 plus 1 times 0. So that's going to be only 1. That's why we have a 1. Is that clear? Uh, let us do one more before we can move on. Uh, we can even do diagonal. So let us do diagonal phi phi. So that means multiply row phi in the first matrix with column phi in the second matrix. That's going to be 1 times 1 plus 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0 plus 1 times 1 plus 0 times 0 plus 1 times 1. So that's going to be 3. And you should realize that by doing this, we are also kind of transforming the, or not transforming, we are building an undirected graph. So we could call this co-citation coupling matrix as an adjacency matrix with some weights. And what do the weights indicate? Uh, the numbers. So, like for example, the example of 5, 3, we say two papers have cited 5 and 3, right? So, the entry for row 5, column 3 is 2. So, that should also mean the entry for 3, 5 should also be 2 because row 3, column 5, you see, is also 2. Because if two papers have cited both 3 and 5, that should be that that 2 should be there for both 5 3 as well as 3 5 so that's why it's a symmetric matrix the citation coupling the co citation coupling matrix the product is a symmetric matrix even though we work with directed graph adjacency matrices 
the product is going to be a symmetric matrix okay uh, that's something important to consider so we can build now what is called an undirected graph of these six papers and there's an edge between two papers if there's at least one paper that has co-cited both of them and there's no edge between two papers if no papers have co-cited both of them okay so using that model we can build an undirected graph of these papers uh, uh, based on this score citation coupling matrix and you see the diagonal entries are going to be non-zero values for most of the time and what those two entries indicate so let us interpret this entry for phi and phi it says 3 here because we just went through the calculations so we got 3 that means 3 papers have cited both 5 and 5 right uh, so it's like making a copy of phi and putting it out there and copying all those edges that are leading to phi and coming out of phi. So you see three papers, one, four and six have cited phi and that's what that three indicates. So the diagonal entries indicate how many papers are citing a particular paper because it is comparing a paper with itself. So that's why the diagonal just indicates how many papers have cited up that particular paper. So for vertex 1, you see number 2, that means 2 papers, in this case 3 and 6 have cited paper 1, that's why we see an entry 2. For vertex 4, you again see 2 papers, 1 and 2 have cited vertex 4, so for vertex 4 we see an entry 2. So the diagonal indicates that, number of papers that are citing the, a particular paper. Okay. Uh, so now if you go back and look at the strength and weakness, it may be easy to understand. Uh, so the strength is, if I add more uh, vertices to this network, if there are new, some new papers that have come up, and those papers are citing these papers, then it is possible for the course citation coupling numbers for any two papers to increase. So that's why uh, the course citation count of papers could increase with time. And the rate at which the increase happens could indicate the evolution of a field. So if there is a field <coughs> excuse me, for which uh, 10 years back the entries almost remain the same like this. There was no appreciable increase between then and now. That means there is no growth in that area. Uh, no, not many newspapers were published and uh, they did not cite these papers. On the other hand, uh, the numbers drastically increased from ten, since 10 years back. That means a lot of new papers are published in this area and they are citing these papers. So the core citation count could indicate the growth of an academic area, field. Okay? And it also measures the opinion of the authors in the sense that uh, if a lot of papers are citing, co-citing two papers, I and J, that means a lot of authors are thinking on the same lines of these two authors I and J. So uh, if two papers I and J have a lot of citation count, it means their opinion is also uh, similar to the opinion of several other authors out there. Okay, And the weaknesses, uh, if you see the citation coupling is a measure of the relative similarity of two papers. So if two papers have to be evaluated based on the score citation coupling matrix, then uh, there should be at least some uh, accept a few, uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, what do you call, reasonable number of papers that are citing both of them. As I said earlier, if one paper just got published, it may be very related to some other paper, but using the score citation coupling count, we cannot quantify that similarity right away because the second one paper just got published so one of the two papers just got published that means new papers have to be published first and then they should co-cite these two papers that will take time it will not happen right away so if you come back after some time and evaluate the co-citation coupling of the paper that was newly published few years back and then the paper that was out there for a long time their numbers would have increased by then okay so uh, uh, in order to evaluate the relative similarity using this measure, new papers should be published and uh, 
be citing both these papers and that will take time. So it's not something that can be measured right away after a paper gets published. Okay, is that clear? We'll do one more thing and then we'll stop for today. Any question on this? Okay, so let me save this.